I was sitting in a police interview room in the mid-sized Midwestern city where I had lived my entire life, with my friend and lawyer Ralph Boston sitting next to me. Ralph whispered to me for the second time in the last five minutes, Lucas, I again advise you not to say anything. Just exercise your right to a lawyer. I'm Lucas Worthington. It's a top-class name, especially when combined with my pretentious, never-used middle name, Rockefeller, because my parents are so damn rich. I'm rich too, but not because of their money. I made my own as a dot-dot-com specialist, so at 29 years old, I'm worth over $50,000. However, I don't belong to the upper class. I'm an ordinary guy who just happened to have money. I drink beer, play basketball, sit in the stands at baseball games, start brawls and fights, and spend at least 40 hours a week doing volunteer work, mostly, but not exclusively, for a charity I set up for disadvantaged children in the poor areas of my city. I'm about to be questioned by two detectives about the untimely murder of my beautiful but unfaithful wife Ashley and one of her lovers Brad Sidley, which occurred a couple of nights ago at Sidley's apartment. I don't feel too bad about it because Ashley blossomed into a cheating gold digger from the moment she married me, and within the next two weeks I was going to file for divorce on the grounds of adultery. As for Brad Sidley, he was a total jerk who I beat the crap out of twice. Not because of Ashley, but simply because he was a loudmouth braggart who told me the wrong things at the wrong time. When experienced Detective Roy Benson entered the room, he was followed by a newcomer, Detective Will Watson, although Watson had already been a police officer for several years. How Watson was promoted to detective, I have no idea. He looks good and is a real talker, which some people find charming. But in my opinion, he is dumb as a plug. My eyebrows raised and I smiled inwardly. Benson began like this. As I understand it, you are ready to talk to us, Lucas, despite the presence of a spokesman for your interests. First of all, Detective Benson, I am not your friend, so you will address me as Mr. Worthington, I said. But before I could finish my thought, Watson chuckled. Titled Ass. I turned to Watson, looked straight at him, and said, You know, Will, every time I see you, I remember the movie Menagerie. A puzzled expression appeared on his face, but before he could say anything else, I continued, I remember Dean Wearmere telling Flounder, You can't live your whole life fat, dumb, and ugly, son. Well, the quote is not entirely accurate, but close enough. You remind me so much of Flounder, and for the sake of facilitating this interrogation, keep your fat, stupid, ugly mouth shut, or I'll have to do to you the same thing I did in the locker room our junior year at good old Hudson High after football practice. You remember this, don't you, asshole? It brought back pleasant memories for me, but not so much for Will. In the locker room after football practice, Watson called me a horny weakling and pushed me. I threw him on his ass, hugged him, and stuck his head in the toilet. So, I was suspended from the game, but it was worth it. There's no reason to say that, Mr. Worthington, Benson snapped. Then tell your dog on your knees to shut the fuck up. I would like to give answers to the questions, but I'm not going to put up with his behavior, I growled. Watson looked like he wanted to attack me, although he was too cowardly to do so. You may wonder why I was stupid enough to anger a cop who could have made my life difficult, but the reason will become clear later. Benson whispered something to Watson, and he leaned back in his chair, staring at me. Before I was so rudely interrupted, I was also going to say that this interview is only being conducted because your department has agreed to videotape the entire process, and in the understanding that the moment you lie to me the first time, it will all be over. Also, Ask your questions efficiently, because I'll be done in two hours. We don't agree to a time limit, Benson said, visibly annoyed. Obviously, either you didn't talk to Chief Jackson or you didn't listen to him, because I made these terms clear to him and he accepted them. Do you agree, or can I leave now? Benson and I looked at each other for 30 seconds before he said, Okay, let's get started. I definitely took off my watch and started the timer function. Benson, with Watson only whispering to him if he wanted to ask something, 
because he knew that I would never answer any of his questions, began his interrogation. I answered all their questions honestly, although it was clear that they did not believe me because I knew that they would never be able to prove that it was I who killed my cheating wife or her lover. About an hour after Watson whispered something to Benson, he said, how do you explain the presence of your DNA on Sidley's clothes? I stopped the timer on my watch, put it on my wrist and said, This is your first and only lie, goodbye, and stood up, after which Ralph and I left. Benson and Watson shouted something after us, but I did not listen and did not attach any importance to their words. Ralph and I walked to his office, located just a few blocks from police headquarters, giggling to each other most of the way. As we entered the closed conference room, Ralph laughed. I don't know who you are, the bravest or the stupidest client I've ever had. Can I be both? I grinned. Why were you so confident dealing with those cops, Lucas? For two reasons. Firstly, I didn't do it. And secondly, I have an undeniable alibi, supported by video recording, for the entire possible time of the murder which, according to the medical examiner, was between noon and three o'clock in the afternoon of the fifth of this month. Where is the video from? This is a video from a basketball clinic where I was tested in a city 90 miles from here, and the entire time of which is on video, starting at 11 a.m., an hour lunch break at 12.30, and ending before 4 p.m. It was filmed by a guy whose day job is a police videographer, but I paid him to film it at the clinic because I plan to use most of it for presentations at boys and girls clubs around the country in connection with my charity. I have a dozen copies in my safe at home. Let me ask the paralegal to go with you to get a copy for me. Ralph smiled. Only after you treat me to lunch. Working with Watson and Benson made me hungry. I chuckled. Two days later at 6.30 a.m., Watson and about half a dozen other cops served me a search warrant. I'm sure they wanted to wake me up and inconvenience me, but I had already been training for half an hour. Watson had a big shit-eater grin on his face when he served the warrant. Have fun, idiot, I grumbled, taking out my bike to finish my workout outside. Don't steal anything. All valuable things are listed in my catalog. Watson responded annoyed. Fuck you. The two reasons I had no problem leaving them to search my house were because I had nothing to hide and because I had professionally hidden high-tech cameras in every room, which is how I originally caught Ashley cheating, though I never told her about this evidence. When I returned from my bike ride a little over an hour later, the police were already leaving. Watson saw me and with a wide grin handed me a bag of evidence, which, as it turned out, contained a gun. Since I didn't have a weapon, I knew it was planted, but I wasn't worried because the cameras showed it was planted. After checking the cameras, which took about an hour, I immediately called Ralph and brought him up to date. In two days, they were going to arrest me. Ralph's friend at the police station alerted him, and he and I showed up at the station just as the task force was about to move out to arrest me at my charity in the most public manner, having already arranged for the presence of two local television stations. They were very angry that I stole their glory. I just smiled. Ralph had already petitioned the fairest judge in the local court for a bail hearing the next morning. I spent only one night in prison. Those bastards put me in a cell with a real scumbag named Melvin Brixie, with whom I'm sure they agreed to beat me up. This also didn't work for two reasons. I caught Melvin off guard by telling him as soon as I walked into the cell that I knew the cops had promised him something if he beat me up. After that, I immediately told him that I was rich and that I was not a failure myself, and if he testified in my favor, then I would pay for the services of the best criminal lawyer in the area who would take his case, and if he didn't like that deal, then he will be surprised by my physical reaction, and that I will not stop until one of us dies. Given his size and background, Melvin would have ended up beating me to a pulp, but he immediately liked me for my aggressive approach. When Ralph met with me the next day at my bail hearing, I told him that I was paying for Melvin's defense and asked his senior partner, a criminal defense lawyer, to meet with Melvin that same day. In parting, I shook Melvin's hand, and the two jailers who accompanied me 
looked at us with their mouths agape. The DA himself was present at the bail hearing. It was an election year. This is a complete asshole who dealt with my father when he was in private practice and got what he deserved. He treated the case as a high-profile one to ensure his re-election. He made very disparaging comments about me, which made me very angry. Luckily, Ralph has a much cooler head than I do, so he tempered the DA's arguments with logic instead of calling him the asshole that he was. Ralph also pointed out the disruption to my charity work that would occur if I was sent to prison, and that I was clearly not a flight risk. I was released on $2,000 cash bail and forced to hand over my passport, but without a wrist monitor. When I returned to Ralph's office, we had worked out our strategy in just over two hours. When we finished, we grinned. He immediately had his technical expert review the DVD of my alibi that I had given him. We put the relevant scenes from my home cameras during the police search into an easy-to-display format, and Ralph began contacting the alibi witnesses to tell them to cooperate less with the police. However, the first thing Ralph did was file a notice with the court that we were exercising our right under state and local law to have a trial within 90 days of my arrest, which was infinitely faster than the prosecutor and the court were accustomed to. Most criminal defendants, especially if they are out on bail, want to drag out the process as long as possible. Also, unlike most of the accused, I did not avoid the media. Gave interviews to every reporter who asked for it. Radio, television, newspapers, social media, whatever. In every interview, I called the district attorney an idiot who was incompetent and should be removed in the next election, and the police detectives handling my case as corrupt and ineffective, while praising the rest of the police force. I know for a fact that I angered a lot of people. That was my intention. The prosecutor appointed female prosecutor Suzanne Carney to lead the case. She was young, but already experienced, although she had just transferred to his office from a larger city after a messy divorce that I found out about when I found her on the internet. She was only 30, only a year older than me, and judging by the photographs, she was simply stunning. Although she was clearly intelligent and competent, having less than 90 days to prepare a case, when she had other responsibilities and was in a new work environment, was very difficult for her. So after she had the case for about two weeks, she asked for a plea conference with Ralph and me. We only agreed because I wanted to meet her. We went to her office, where she was waiting with two assistant prosecutors, Benson, Watson, and an attractive, if strangely dressed young woman whose title was unknown to me and who was not introduced to us. Ralph and I were polite, but we didn't say much. Carney listed the highlights of her case. The murder weapon, a .380 caliber pistol, was found in my home during a search and was positively identified by ballistics, and my DNA was also found on it. The video of my alibi ends at 1.50 p.m., giving me enough time to commit the murder by 3 war p.m., according to the medical examiner. I had a strong motive because Sidley and Ashley were having an affair and getting rid of her was cheaper than divorcing her. And my history of quarrels with Sidley in the past, where she claimed Sidley had gotten the best of me, is clearly not true. But the source of this information was a friend of mine who, although not lying, reported it incorrectly. However, due to her generosity, she agreed to find me guilty of first-degree manslaughter with a sentence of 8 to 15 years in prison. As previously agreed during her speech, Ralph and I simply smiled. This seemed to unnerve everyone on her part. When she finished, I said, Miss Carney, could we meet with you individually, without strangers? This completely stunned her entire team. I, uh, I can't do this. It is unethical to speak to you alone while being represented by an attorney. Actually, Miss Carney, Ralph smiled. Since both Mr. Worthington and I fully agree, there is no ethical problem and we will both sign a statement to that effect. After a minute of awkward back and forth, I chuckled and said, please call your secretary, dictate this statement to her or him, and ask him or her to bring it here for me and Ralph to sign. Suzanne called her secretary, dictated what she wanted, and while we waited for the document, I engaged Suzanne in the most pleasant, non-legal conversation I could manage. 
smiling at her constantly. Less than five minutes later, her secretary, a man, came in with a document. After a quick look, Ralph and I signed it, the secretary and one of the assistant prosecutors witnessed our signatures, and the secretary left to make copies for us. After that, everyone left the room except me and Suzanne. As soon as the door closed, I began, Suzanne, since you are relatively new here, I want to tell you some things that you may not know. Detective Watson is corrupt, and your boss, the district attorney, is incompetent. If you continue this case, both the police and your office will be completely disgraced, so disgraced that it will be difficult to recover from it. Others who work with you do not have your best interests at heart. Do you have something specific that you want to tell me? She pouted. No, I will leave this for the court if you decide to continue. Just a warning that nothing is as it seems, and you should take a closer look at the discovery of the gun and my alibi. I don't want you personally to get it for this. If you do not investigate further, I suggest you ask the district attorney to reassign the case. Why do you care? She pouted again. Because I like you, and I'm looking for a new relationship since my cheating wife has passed away and would like to get to know you better, I answered with a smile. Obviously, Suzanne was stunned because she just stared at me with her mouth open for two whole minutes. Finally, she regained the ability to speak and asked, Are you serious, or is this some kind of trick? I'll tell you how serious I am. I know that your favorite artist is Bon Jovi, and on my iPhone I will buy you and me two front row tickets to his show in New York from a friend of mine for his next concert in exactly 123 days, and I invite you to come with me. I smiled, taking out my iPhone. After another long pause, she said, you are crazy. Just tell me whether or not you accept my plea deal, which expires after today. Miss Carney, I'm sorry if I upset you. Perhaps after finding me not guilty you will change your mind, and I will be as kind to you as I can. However, to answer your question, I reject your offer and any future plea bargains because I am innocent. At this moment, while she was still in a semi-shocked state, I quickly took her hand, kissed it, and left the room. As we were leaving the building, passing Watson, I gave him the middle finger. Ralph chuckled. How did everything go? He asked. She turned down my offer of a date at a Bon Jovi concert in New York, but she was interested in me. I'll try again after the trial. Given what happens there, will she ever talk to you again? I hope so, I chuckled. Maybe she'll develop a sense of humor. Dream, Ralph laughed. I don't want to spoil the outcome of my trial for you in advance, but I have to say a few things. The DVD we gave the prosecution with my alibi appears to cut out at 1.50, but if you continue to play it for another 30 minutes, it resumes at 1.50 and shows me until it cuts off at 4 gara p.m. If the prosecutor's office or the cops had continued to play it instead of cutting it off at static, they would have seen it. In addition, the prosecutor's office was under the impression that Ashley and I did not have a prenuptial agreement. But there was one, although the only people who knew about it were my business lawyer Ralph and her friend, who witnessed the signing, but now lives over 2,000 miles. We listed her as a witness on a long list, but the prosecution was never able to contact her, and under local rules, we were not required to reveal what witnesses might say. Fortunately, we got a good but unsentimental judge, although, given the strength of our case, anyone would have been suitable. The jury was selected in just two hours. Our jury consultant and Ralph were pleased. Although we felt we were doing well, there was no reason not to select good jurors. The prosecution began with the medical examiner presenting photographs of the gruesome death and the time and cause of death. Between noon and three o'clock in the afternoon of the 5th, Two 380 caliber bullet wounds to Sidley's head and a through one from which Ashley died were his main statements. Ralph's only cross-examination was aimed at establishing the exact time and manner of death. The police witness who assessed my financial situation testified how much money I would have to pay Ashley if we divorced. Since adultery is not grounds for divorce proceedings and there is no evidence of a prenuptial agreement. 
Ralph scored many points by introducing into evidence a prenuptial agreement that limited her payment in the event of a divorce due to infidelity to only $50,000 and in the event of a divorcee for any other reason to only 1,000 T's. Ralph also embarrassed the witness by asking if she had ever tried to contact my business lawyer to see if there was a prenuptial agreement and not just based on what she had heard from Ashley's friends. Her answer, no, brought a look of disgust on the faces of several jurors. Suzanne then called a ballistics expert who positively identified the 380 caliber pistol found in my home as the murder weapon, and a DNA expert who testified that my DNA was on the weapon. Ralph cross-examined to make it clear that the ballistics expert did not personally know how the gun was found, and the DNA expert testified that there was no DNA on the bullets in the gun, and that, given the locations on the gun where DNA was found, she could have gotten there by transference. Up until this point, Suzanne seemed confident. She got her first real indication that her case was falling apart when she called her star witness, Detective Will Watson. Watson testified about the search warrant for my home, how within 30 minutes Corporal Cheryl Billings, one of the officers conducting the search, found the gun, called Detective Watson, picked it up in his gloved hands and put it in an evidence bag, while Detective Watson looked at it. His testimony only took about 20 minutes. When Ralph stood up for cross-examination, he held in his hand the remote control for the courtroom's large screen projector. Detective Watson, what were you wearing on the day of the search? asked Ralph. Um, I don't remember. Ralph showed a photo taken outside my house with all sorts of police officers around, taken by a camera on the front door, which showed him wearing dark blue trousers, a light blue long sleeve shirt, a distinctive red and yellow tie, black dress shoes, and a tweed a sports jacket that seemed bulky. Is this a photograph of you on the day of the search, showing your clothes? Er, uh, yes, it seems like that, Watson replied. I didn't ask you if it was similar, whether your clothes on the day of the search are shown in this photo or not. If necessary, we can call Corporal Billings or other officers to testify. Ralph growled with hostility. Uh, yes, this is exactly how I was dressed on the day of the search. How often do you wear this tie? It's not often, actually. It's a new tie, and since it was an important day, I decided to wear it, Watson replied. Have you ever been to Mr. Worthington's house before the day of the search? After a pause, beginning to suspect something, Watson replied, I do not remember. Don't remember. Are you friends with Mr. Worthington or his ex-wife Ashley? No. What reason could you have for being in their house at any time other than during a search? I can't remember a single one. You've never been to the Worthington house other than the day of the search, have you, Detective Watson? Ralph growled. After another pause, Watson shifted in his chair and answered, No. Here's a video of someone taking a green toothbrush from Mr. Worthington's bathroom. Ralph continued immediately, showing the scene from the camera in my bathroom. Is that you with your characteristic yellow and red tie, Detective Watson? I, I, I've never seen this video before, he mumbled awkwardly. Probably not, Ralph chuckled. Just answer the question. After another delay, yes. Similarly, are you the one who takes some of the red and white clothes from the laundry basket in Mr. Worthington's laundry? Another delay, yes. Did you take the gun out from under your tweed jacket in Mr. Worthington's closet, rubbed it with the green bristles of a toothbrush, then rubbed it on your red and white shirt, and then put it in the top drawer of the closet near the window in Mr. Worthington's closet? A shocked Watson stared silently at the screen as the video was played three times in a row. I claim the Fifth Amendment, he said breathlessly. Did you have an affair with Mr. Worthington's wife, Ashley? A shocked Watson muttered so quietly that the court reporter asked him to speak up. I insist on the Fifth Amendment. Here's a video taken two weeks before the murder of you and Ashley having sex in one of Mr. Worthington's guest bedrooms. After visually showing the sex tape for 15 seconds, the judge said, You can turn off the video, Mr. Boston. We get the point. Answer the question, Detective Watson. He muttered, I claim the Fifth Amendment. 
There are no more questions, Ralph declared. The entire courtroom stared at Suzanne as she slowly stood up. Your Honor, can we take a break? You definitely need him, Miss Carney. We'll meet in two hours, the judge said, and then banged her gavel. All the jurors either smiled or shook their heads. Detective Benson was in the courtroom. I approached him and asked, Are you going to arrest Watson now? He had a glazed expression on his face, but he answered, I don't have a warrant. But there are sufficient grounds for charges, if not of murder, then at least of tampering with evidence, I answered. Murder? He gasped. Who the hell do you think killed Ashley and Sidley? This is the guy who planted the murder weapon. Take courage, Benson, and arrest him, I growled. To my surprise, Benson nodded to the bailiff, and the two of them placed Watson under arrest. While we were having lunch, Suzanne called Ralph. She wanted to meet. We expected her to say she was withdrawing from the case. To our surprise, she said instead, I talked to the district attorney, and he said we'll accept a guilty plea to second-degree manslaughter just two years in prison. Outraged, I shouted, Are you telling me that the asshole Watson who killed my wife will only get two years? Suzanne, who had the decency to look embarrassed, replied, No, I'm offering this plea agreement to you because we believe you likely had some kind of relationship with Watson. I was speechless. I came at her with such an angry tirade that she looked scared to death, and it was only because Ralph had the strength and size to hold me back that I didn't hit her in the face. I would never have hurt her, but outwardly, I was angry more than ever. As we ran out of the conference room, I shouted, Fuck you, bitch! Ralph thwarted my anger when, as he led me away, he whispered, Does that mean you won't take her to the Bon Jovi concert in New York? I stared at him for a few seconds, still burning with anger, and then burst out laughing. When we reconvened after a two-hour delay, the judge called the lawyers to the stand. They were talking animatedly. When Ralph returned, I asked him what was the matter. He said, The judge assumed that Suzanne would throw out the lawsuit due to prejudice. When she refused, the judge reprimanded her, but she did not budge, saying that the prosecutor wanted her to continue. I chuckled. After Suzanne called as her next witness, the guy she believed told the detectives that Sidley beat me up, giving me a motive to kill him. She realized that everything was going to hell when, during direct interrogation, Ralph didn't even have to conduct cross. He said, Detective Watson must have misunderstood me. I told him that, although Sidley instigated the fight and hit Lucas first, Lucas cleaned his face. Sidley spent the night in hospital. Suzanne then called the videographer about recording my alibi. After clarifying that he was the official videographer for the police department of the city where my basketball clinic is located, she asked, Did you review the video recording you made, which is State Exhibit Number 14? Yes. Is this a full video recording of the event? Yes. Does it show that the defendant, Mr. Worthington, was there until about 1.50 p.m.? No. It shows that he was there until about 4 p.m., and even then we talked to him until about 4.30 p.m., when he left to drive the 90 miles back home. What? The prosecutor said in surprise. I watched the DVD and it stopped at 13.50, and after that it was just static. You obviously didn't view the interference, and I have no idea how it ended up on your copy of the DVD. If you do this, you will see that it lasts up to four hours. Suzanne gave the witness a remote control. He fast-forwarded through the static, showing the rest of the video, and she stopped him as he fast-forwarded to three o'clock, then sat down. Ralph had the witness fast-forward to the end. The DVD showed 16.01, then the videographer confirmed that he saw me with his own eyes at the event from approximately 11 way she am to 16.30 p.m. Suzanne said with the look of a cornered dog, The prosecution has everything. Typically at this point the judge will dismiss the jury and the defense will file a trivial motion for a verdict. The judge did not bother herself with this. She asked, Mr. Boston, do you have a proposal? Yes, Your Honor, I am asking for a verdict of not guilty. I have permission, she said, banging her gavel. Miss Carney, I'm waiting for you in my room. The jury is out with my thanks. After that, 
the press was hungry for interviews. On the steps of the courthouse, Ralph first ranted about how the prosecution had done me a terrible service, and that he knew all along what the outcome of the case would be, and if the police and the prosecution had been honest, the case would never have been brought. He was a little careful with his words. I wasn't. After talking to Ralph, I told him that anyone who would vote for a crooked DA in the upcoming election was a fool, that Watson was the killer, and that the police should do their own investigation. I also said I would file a lawsuit against the DA for false prosecution. Another lawyer from Ralph's firm filed suit the next day, naming the district attorney Suzanne, whom I considered a heartless fool, and Detective Watson as defendants. Local media blew up the story. The district attorney and chief of police were in hiding. Three days after the charges were dropped as I was finishing up work at my charity, having just run an after-school program for disadvantaged girls and boys, a young woman approached me. I vaguely recognized her. Mr. Worthington, I'm Shirley Williams, she said, holding out her hand. I shook it and then said, I think I've seen you before, but I can't admit it. Yes, although we were not introduced to each other, I sat in the courtroom when you had your first plea negotiations with Miss Carney, and I was present at your trial. Now everything has fallen into place. Although her dress was skimpy and she wore what appeared to be deliberately ugly glasses, I had initially noticed that she was attractive, and now, facing me, she looked even better. What do you have to do with my business? I asked, holding her hand a little longer than was necessary or appropriate. I am an intern, fresh out of law school and an observer. My internship ends next week. Miss Carney was too embarrassed to come to you herself, so she asked me to come talk to you, Shirley continued. Let's go to my office, I smiled making small talk with her as we walked a couple hundred meters to my office building from the recreation center where I was holding an after-school program. When we entered my office, I invited her to sit down. She looked around. Your office is much nicer and neater than I expected, she said. Sorry to disappoint you, I smiled. She smiled back, then continued. All members of the prosecution team apologize for the errors of judgment that occurred during your case, but are puzzled by the static gap in the DVD you provided as an alibi. They are puzzled, right? I smiled again. Besides, Ms. Carney and everyone else involved really want to apologize for everything. If everything had been investigated more thoroughly, the case would have been closed before trial. That's right, I smiled again. After a pause, Shirley said, You're not going to make this easier, are you? Should I? I smiled again. Shirley sighed. Besides, Miss Carney wants to know what she can do to get you to drop your lawsuit against her. After a long pause, I asked, Why are you here and not her? I think that after your tirade against her on the last day of the trial, she is afraid of you. Why was she such a heartless piece of trash before I attacked her? She should have confronted the DA and dropped the case immediately after Watson's testimony. Now she understands it, and sincerely apologizes. Let me ask you a few questions. Of course, you don't have to answer them, and if you don't want to, you can get up and leave without any comment from me. Is it clear? Yes, she answered cautiously. How old are you? Twenty-six. Are these glasses fake? Yes. Why do you wear them? To discourage guys from pestering me. Do you have a romantic relationship? No. Are you heterosexual? Yes. What are your plans after the internship ends at the end of next week? I hope that I will be offered a job in the prosecutor's office, but if not, then I will find a job in a local law firm, since I like the area. I already have two possible vacancies. What are you doing on Saturday evening? As of today, I have no plans. Maybe my roommate and I will go to a club. What is your personal mobile phone number? XXXXXX. All my questions and all her answers were asked completely dispassionately, without emotions or facial expressions. After a long pause, I said, Tell Miss Carney that if you are offered a job in the prosecutor's office, I will drop the lawsuit against her. Tell her to tell the DA that if he makes a sincere public apology, Watson will be charged with the murder of my ex-wife, not just for his current falsification charge, and if you are offered a job in the DA's office, I will drop the case against him. Shirley chuckled silently. Are you teasing me? I replied stoically. 
in no case. In fact, let me put this in writing. I went on the computer, wrote down what I just said, printed it out, signed it, and dated it. At the bottom, he added, otherwise we'll see you in court. I handed the paper to Shirley. She looked at it, smiled, and said, thank you, Mr. Worthington, and extended her hand. I shook it and said, you're welcome, Miss Williams. Looking out the window and seeing her leaving my building, I called her on her cell phone. She took it out of the pocket on the side of her purse, looked at the caller ID, and smiled, answering. Shirley Williams. Hello, Miss Williams, I said. Lucas Worthington. Isn't this the Lucas Worthington I just met? She asked with a slight hint of amusement in her voice. The same one. I understand that you don't have any firm plans for Saturday night, and I was wondering if you'd like to have dinner with me and see The Mousetrap at the Artist's Playhouse. It's the longest play in history. From the window, I saw her smile widely. After some delay, she said, Yes, I agree, Mr. Worthington. Would you like me to meet you at a restaurant? No, if you don't mind, please text me your address, and I'll pick you up at 6.15 on Saturday evening. I'll do that she said, still smiling. After she ended the call, I saw her typing on her smartphone, and as soon as she returned it to her purse, I heard a beep on my cell phone. The message included her address, along with a smiling emoji. Between the time Shirley met me on Tuesday and the time I picked her up on Saturday, I paid for and received a full report on her from a private investigator. I didn't need another gold digger like Ashley, and I felt a connection with Shirley, who intrigued me in the short time we talked. It turned out that she had gone through a pretty messy divorce during her first year of law school when her husband cheated on her, got straight A's in law school, did charity work part-time, and had all the hallmarks of a good citizen who grew up in a high middle-class neighborhood with respected parents. One is a doctor, the second is an artist, and two older brothers. One is a business owner, and the second is a doctor. When I picked Shirley up, she looked great. Discreet, but stylish clothes, light makeup, attractive hairstyle, no fake glasses. I asked to see her roommate before we left. I chatted with my neighbor and gave her two tickets to a concert at a local venue the following weekend. This impressed both her and Shirley. Dinner with Shirley was the strangest experience of my life. After small talk on the way to the restaurant, the most expensive in our city, at least in my opinion, we had only been sitting for a minute when she said, We don't need to exchange basic information about each other, do we, Lucas? What I mean is that I already know almost all the relevant facts about your background from the investigation the police and prosecutors conducted on you before your trial, and I'm sure you have experienced people who have done a deep dive on me. Why don't we just move on to what makes us tick, what makes us happy, what are our goals in life? important things like where we went to school, how many children are in our families, etc. I was surprised, but not as much as I might have thought. The research I did on Shirley, combined with the exchange of information during our 101-minute dinner, meant that I knew her as well as anyone in my life. We had to skip dessert in order to get to the show on time, but since we both stated that we weren't big dessert fans, it wasn't much of a problem. The Mouse Trap is an Agatha Christie comedic, murder mystery with a resolution at the end. Neither of us had ever seen it before, but we both loved it and decided that the two-plus hours we spent watching, it was worth it. When the performance ended, it was a quarter to eleven. Shirley became more and more comfortable with skin-to-skin -skin contact, and I became more and more appreciative of her body and personality. When we got to my car, I asked, would you like to go to a club or do something else? The evening is not too late for us 20-year-olds. She looked into my eyes the way a cobra or a mongoose, I couldn't tell which, looked at its prey for a long time before answering. Her answer, a question, really, was the most surprising part of an amazing evening. After a deep breath, she asked, Have you ever had sex on the first date? It took me a while to realize the question, but I didn't ask her to repeat it. My measured answer was, no, why are you asking? Well, we know each other as well as people who have been meeting every weekend for months. The only thing we don't know about each other is how compatible we are between the sheets, 
or on the kitchen table, or in the pool, or... You get the idea. I feel a strong sexual attraction to you. If you feel the same way about me, let's make this the first night for both of us, she said stoically, and then smiled widely. I moved closer to her, hugged her, and gave her a series of short kisses with increasing passion. The last one wasn't short. It lasted a good two minutes, and cemented in my mind that she was a great kisser and a very warm person. When we broke the kiss, I asked, Would you like to see my engravings? She laughed and replied, Let's. Only stupid people get into an intense relationship right after they've just gotten rid of a cheating spouse, surely through divorce, me through murder. Clearly Shirley and I are idiots. When we got to my house, our sexual encounter was not intense. We didn't tear each other's clothes off. Instead, we stood face to face and looked into each other's eyes. By this time, I realized that I really liked Shirley's personality and her body. Every part of her body that could be identified when she was dressed looked perfect. With the exception of her butt, nothing was too big and nothing was too small. Since I like big firm butts, I was delighted. Shirley slowly and methodically removed my shirt by feel only as her eyes were directly on mine. When she took it off, I decided to say what was on my mind. I want to fuck you on the kitchen table. Without hesitating for a second, she replied, bent over him or for me to lie on him. Last thing, you do everything yourself. She chuckled. I kissed her and lifted her sculpted hips so that her legs were on my torso. And without breaking the kiss, although I hit a few walls because my eyes were practically closed, I carried her to the kitchen. Luckily, there were only documents and a few pieces of stainless steel on the table. Nothing breakable, because I brushed them off the table with one hand. Then he put her butt on the table and broke the kiss. As we looked at each other again, I reached under her dress to remove her underwear, but couldn't find it. You're really bad, aren't you? I smiled, and she chuckled. Hell yes! I lifted her dress and immediately fell to her private part with such enthusiasm as I had never taken on anything in my life. She leaned back on the table and soon moaned. She caught the climax so quickly that if she were a racing car, it would be like she accelerated from zero to 60 miles in two seconds. Coming back from her climax, she muttered, I thought you wanted to fuck me. I was still a little hungry, so I decided to have a snack first, I muttered. Bastard, she said, sitting up and unbuckling my belt. I kissed her again. Sex with her was mind-blowing. I was moving at a speed comparable to the 146 beats per minute of Bruno Mars' Cast Out of Heaven while she made inarticulate noises. I came to the final climax so quickly that I was afraid it was premature, but apparently she was just as excited because she followed me and began to shake as if she was having a seizure. When it was over, I practically lost consciousness. I had a feeling of euphoria that I don't think I've ever felt before, and her moans turned into purrs. After some time, we both came to our senses. To bed, was her only comment. I jumped around until I kicked off my shoes, pants, boxers, and one sock, while she pulled her dress over her head and unclasped her bra. She jumped into my arms and I kissed her periodically, bumping into walls every now and then as I stumbled up the stairs to my bedroom. Although it wasn't an intentional decision on our part, we ended up spending the entire weekend together. Shirley had no problems in bed, and we tried everything we wanted with her. Outside of bed, she was more pleasant than any other woman I knew, cheerful, genuinely affectionate, playful, and easy to talk to on a variety of topics, from the mundane and mundane to the serious and spiritual. As we ate breakfast at the same table where we had sex less than 48 hours earlier, I suddenly remembered what we had talked about in my office. In between eating a cheese omelet, I asked, Shirley, since we had so much fun this weekend, I forgot to ask if you passed on my suggestions to Suzanne an asshole. After swallowing a piece of English muffin, she replied, Yes, Suzanne was very pleased and guaranteed that I would be offered full-time work next week. She chewed and swallowed another bite of the cake, then continued. However, she told me not to tell the asshole about this proposal. Everyone, including him, knows you're the reason he'll lose the election, 
and he might just put my job offer on hold if I tell him it's you who said it. Plus, she thinks he'll never apologize, and besides, she wants your lawsuit against him to continue. I nodded in satisfaction and agreement as I continued to eat. What's actually funny is that Suzanne asked if you were interested in her personally. I think that despite your tirade against her on the last day of the trial, she is hoping for a relationship. After this comment, she gave me a sinister grin. I grinned back. This won't happen. I found something better. I smiled and finished my breakfast. When I parked in front of Shirley's house, she became more open than any other person in my life. So, Lucas, we've known each other for a few days now, and we've discovered that we're more compatible with you in and out of bed than anyone else we've ever known or considered possible. Do you know what you would do if you were really smart? She chuckled and then kissed me on the lips with a quick but meaningful kiss. You would ask me to move in with you this weekend, with the idea of giving you a ring after we've lived together for a few months. After another kiss and a smile, she walked out the door, jiggling her nicely big, firm ass, and walked into the building without looking back. I thought deeply for about 30 seconds. Then he took out his cell phone, dialed the number that was now summer one on my contact list, and when Shirley answered, he said, Listen, Shirley, I just had a better idea. Why don't you move in with me next weekend? Why would you, Lucas? This is so unexpected. Are you sure? Yes, I thought a lot. It seems like forever. Okay, she laughed, but you'll have to pay my share of the rent because Judy won't be able to do it herself. And she ended the call. Tricky bitch. I chuckled to myself. I could go on for many more pages about how stupid we were to jump into a relationship, how amazing it was that it not only worked out, but made our lives better than they could have been, how both accepted my charity work, although she was a tough prosecutor, and how everything was right in the world. But one episode will tell you everything you want to know. I was in the courtroom when Shirley Worthington, eight months pregnant, delivered a masterful closing argument in Will Watson's murder and obstruction of justice trial in the deaths of Ashley Worthington and Brad Sidley. In her final statement, she convinced everyone that Watson was in love with Ashley, was outraged that she was having an affair with Sidley, and decided to kill Sidley in order to get her under his control and frame me. Unfortunately, he was careless when shooting Sidley, and one bullet passed through him and into Ashley, killing her. As the jury left the courtroom, I gave Shirley a big hug and kiss and gently rubbed her belly, telling her how proud I was of her. By the time we returned from afternoon tea, no more than an hour had passed since the jury began deliberating. She had received word that the jury had reached a verdict. After the sergeant major said, guilty on all counts, I waited while Shirley accepted congratulations from everyone around here, even from opposing counsel. When it was my turn to congratulate, I whispered in her ear, Tonight I'll give you a nice bubble bath. I'll have your favorite food delivered from the most expensive Italian restaurant in town. I'll give you a foot massage, and then we'll have sex. Shirley smiled, kissed me, and said, Sounds like a good plan. At least now that you have me, you won't be able to get me pregnant. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.